It's been nearly three years since Analog released the Mega SG, an FPGA-based console designed to play 8- and 16-bit Sega games. Since then, the FPGA landscape has changed significantly, due in part to the rise of Mr., while mods designed to enhance classic systems have continued to thrive. To compete in this new market, you need a unique approach to design that offers something different. Enter the Analog Pocket. This is the Analog Pocket, an FPGA-driven portable gaming system designed to play a wide range of handheld cartridge games, including the entire Game Boy catalog and Sega's Game Gear. It's a beautifully crafted device with a huge screen, plenty of features, and more. But how does it perform in practice? Analog sent us this review unit in black, along with the dock and associated accessories, to find out. We'll be discussing the system's features and performance, ranging from the build quality and pixel simulation modes, to the performance while docked, and the accuracy of its cores, among other things. This is without a doubt the most ambitious product Analog has released to date, and there's a lot to discuss, so let's dive in. When the Game Boy launched in 1989, Nintendo forever changed the market by offering a portable alternative to console gaming that was actually good. It wasn't the first, but the Game Boy was an important milestone, and since then portable systems have lived alongside home consoles in harmony. Problem is, these machines were created during a time when LCD technology used in the screens was in its infancy, and as a result, those original displays are kinda difficult to enjoy today. In recent years, new solutions have become available. Replacement LCDs are popular, while dedicated clone systems or emulation devices make up another part of the market. Unfortunately, with just a few exceptions, I've rarely found myself completely satisfied, especially from a screen perspective. Which is why the analog pocket was so interesting in the first place. It promises a large screen featuring an aspect ratio that matches the original Game Boy, while utilizing screen simulation functions to mimic those original displays, but more on that in a moment. First, let's talk about the physical device itself. There's no denying that the analog pocket is a beautiful device. Precise lines, subtly rounded corners, and this beautiful Gorilla Glass screen lens really impress when you first pick up the unit. It instantly feels premium in a way that exceeds anything analog has done in the past, and this is important because unlike, say, the Mega SG, you'll be holding the pocket in your hands most of the time. The unit feels solid, yet reasonably light. The face buttons are configured in the traditional diamond shape, while start and select buttons rest near the bottom, straddling the menu button, which has multiple uses in this case. The D-pad is always a sticky issue, though, as it's crucial to the feel of the system. It's pretty good, slightly better than the D-pad functionality on, say, a modded Game Boy. Just like those systems, however, diagonals can be slightly finicky in specific games, but by and large, I found it to perform very well. Around back, you have two shoulder buttons for GBA games and a moderately exposed cartridge slot, which is an interesting design choice as it kind of suggests that carts might wobble without the additional support brace of original hardware, but it turns out it's remarkably solid, plus you get to see the beautiful label artwork adorning many of these games. By default, it accepts cartridges for Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance. As of this review, an adapter for Sega Game Gear games is also available, while support for Neo Geo Pocket Color, Atari Lynx, and more are promised for next year. The unit charges via USB-C, features a 3.5 mini jack output for headphones, a micro SD card slot with various functions, and it includes a Game Boy style link cable connector, which allows you to play multiplayer games even with original Game Boy hardware. Unfortunately, the GameCube link cable does not fit the pocket by default. 
I'm fairly certain it will work with a modified cable, but I wasn't keen on slicing up the plastic on mine. Now once you fire up the pocket, you're greeted with a simple and clean menu system. This is Analog OS, but in its current state, some of the promised features are still very much in development. For now though, it works much like other analog products, but with fewer options due to its portable nature. Some of these options though are exposed when connected to the dock, but we'll discuss those later. The main and most important feature lies in the screen itself and the screen simulation modes available. But to understand why this is so important, we need to take a look back at original hardware. So the original Game Boy uses a screen with a pixel resolution of 160 by 144. It's pretty low, right? Pixels are visibly distinct. You can see each element separated from the surrounding pixels. It's a very specific look and such characteristics apply equally to the other portable systems that the Pocket supports. The art used in these games was almost always crafted specifically for these original panels and resolutions. When blown up in an emulator or displayed on a high resolution screen without any sort of filter, you're left with a chunky looking experience that never felt quite right. So modders have built solutions specifically to try and solve this issue with their LCD replacements. Some of these replacements feature what's called the retro pixel grid, which simulates the black space between the pixels. It looks really good and is something I've used a lot, but the look in the colors and shading was never quite there. So this leaves us in an interesting bind then. The original screens on older hardware are generally of very poor quality and we do not want to replicate the ghosting or low visibility but we do want to emulate the reproduction of color or shades of green in the case of the game boy as well as the pixel structure this is where the pocket comes into play analog has basically created screen modes that simulate the look of the original screens within the fpga hardware itself the original Game Boy presents very distinct pixels and shades of green that feel very authentic when played on the analog pocket, but without any of the unwanted flaws. Okay, so just how accurate is it? So here's the standard Game Boy again, without a backlight, right? This is the original screen. We've already looked at this. Now let's bring back in the funny plane IPS screen mod with the retro pixel mode engaged. It looks pretty good, but the shade of green and the representation of the pixels doesn't quite match the original screen. Now, let's swap in the analog pocket, and you can immediately see how much closer it gets. Firstly, you can see the visible border between Game Boy rendered pixels, kind of like the IPS mod screen. But if you look closely, there's subtle color information within the pixels, designed to more closely simulate the physical characteristics of a real Game Boy screen. You can actually achieve a look a lot like this via emulation on the PC if you set it up correctly. But this is the first time I've found a singular device that can play Game Boy games that produces such an accurate image. In addition, you have access to other modes, including one that simulates the look of the good old Game Boy Light's Indiglo screen. Honestly, perhaps the most impressive filter is the one that's used for the Game Gear. And this is a really tricky system that I feel is not usually well represented, either via emulation or replacement screens. Now, the resolution is 160 by 144, just like Game Boy, but with a wider aspect ratio, meaning wide pixels. The original screens are very hard to see, and none of the replacement screens offer a pixel configuration that fits the look of Game Gear, so you're always subjected to scaling issues. Beyond this, I've found that typical re-releases of Game Gear games on other platforms or even via emulators tend not to take into account the pixel structure of the Game Gear itself. I mean, things like the Elastic Collection from M2 are fantastic, with so much great content and interesting screen modes, but even this doesn't have the option to simulate the look of a classic Game Gear screen. Even the Game Gear Mini falls short in terms of scaling, though at this size it's difficult to notice. The analog pocket, however, delivers a remarkably accurate feeling Game Gear experience, but without any of the flaws of that original panel. In fact, when you compare them, it really is genuinely striking to behold. It's not quite as close as the Game Boy mode, but I think they've struck the right balance. It feels authentic, but minimizes the unwanted flaws, including the awful viewing angles on the Game Gear. 
Comparing against the McWill screen, you should also note a sizable difference in terms of scaling quality. This is because the mod uses a screen resolution that does not perfectly match the 160x144 resolution. There are options to improve this with the mod, but none provide a perfect experience as a result of the screen resolution. Plus, there's also screen tearing since the refresh rate doesn't match either. Game Boy Color then is also interesting. This one looks great. I feel simulating the pixels of the system while modifying the color saturation to suit the content. But more on that feature in a bit. Game Boy Advance then is the last one, and this one is tricky. First, for comparison, I'm using an original Game Boy Advance with a later AGS 101 backlit screen installed. So, this is a modded system, but the LCD panel is official. The pocket in comparison looks fantastic at a glance, and in fact, even with letterboxing as a result of the wider aspect ratio of the GBA hardware, the actual screen real estate is slightly larger than an actual Game Boy Advance. The issue is that GBA uses a resolution that does not scale evenly to 1600 by 1440 and as a result there is some issues with repeating patterns visible across solid colors when using this mode. That said, I would say it's a minor thing overall and it's not especially noticeable for most types of games, but if you look closely, you will see it. And this is where the so-called analog mode comes into play, I suppose, in which it basically displays the game in a raw, upscale pixel mode. This also opens up numerous scaling options in the menu, if you desire, but I'm not a huge fan of this mode. It's just nice that it's there, I suppose. But what is it about the pocket that allows these options to look so good and function so effectively? Firstly, the Pocket uses a very high resolution LTPS LCD panel with 615 pixels per inch. LTPS technology is top tier when it comes to LCD production. It's efficient, allows for densely packed pixel grids, and produces faster motion response along with slightly deeper black levels. The big draw here is that Analog selected such a high quality, high resolution panel with a desirable aspect ratio a problem that faces so many other portable devices made for retro gaming today. Due to this ultra high resolution though, there's more than enough pixels to simulate the characteristics of individual game pixels such as those found in the Game Boy. It allows for a perfect 10x scale where 160 becomes 1600 and 144 becomes 1440. So as I said earlier, the screen is 1600 by 1440. Secondly, the actual work that was poured into Matching the colors goes a long way towards improving the feeling of authenticity. By default, the pocket has presets. For instance, with Game Boy, you can cycle between these different modes, right? But you can also adjust the saturation and sharpness to fine tune things further for games that use color. The ability to reduce the saturation is key here, as most of the original screens couldn't actually display super rich colors. So when you do so, they wind up looking incorrect, especially with GBA games. There's also some other neat options such as the frame blending feature. This does not simply add artificial ghosting to the mix as you might expect, rather it's used in cases where flicker occurs. But why? So check it out. The original Game Boy display is so slow that rapidly flickering an object on and off every other frame has the effect of creating pseudo transparency. This is useful for things like water, clouds, and other such elements within games, right? So on the pocket with frame blending disabled, you actually see this flicker because the screen response is so much faster. Enable this feature, however, and the system blends these two frames together to create the impression of a solid object that still retains pseudo transparency effect. So yeah, the display is exceptional and ultimately the heart of the analog pocket. No other clone device or aftermarket screen mod comes even close to the quality of this panel, which I feel makes this a good example of what's possible with a sizable budget for such a project. Most of the screen mods and emulation-based handhelds are limited by screen selection ultimately. It's expensive and difficult to source a panel like the one used in the pocket, and that's a huge part of the experience here. Oh yes, one tip. While I'm a big collector of original carts, I'm sure many folks will be using an EverDrive or a similar flash cart with the pocket. 
By default, Game Boy carts will start in Game Boy Color mode, which means original Game Boy games will use the Game Boy Color default palette. If you want to retain the original Game Boy screen modes, pop into the menu and toggle this setting to force the system into original Game Boy mode. Pretty important, I think. So are there any flaws then with the screen? Well, even though it's a high-end LCD, you'll still notice artifacts as a result of persistence blur. Note how the patterns in Sonic sort of blend together during fast motion. Conversely, this is still infinitely faster than any real Game Gear or Game Boy screen, but we're still bumping up against the limitations of sample and hold LCD technology. The only way to really overcome this would be to implement some sort of black frame insertion technology, which would have been nice. So, in addition to the screen quality itself, the Pocket also has stereo speakers that can be cranked up to a surprisingly high volume, and these are built into the sides of the unit. The speakers sound excellent, allowing for much higher fidelity than any of the original systems, of course. And yes, you can still use headphones. What I really want to mention regarding the sound, though, is the enhanced audio feature available for Game Boy Advance. You see, by default, I find that the GBA games tend to exhibit this scratchy audio quality, specifically when using sample-based playback, like most games. The higher quality option basically solves this by applying filters in such a way that the audio quality is hugely cleaned up. It's actually kind of similar to the recent M2 developed Castlevania GBA collection released on modern consoles. Take a listen. The M2 collection, however, sounds like it has an even stronger low-pass filter applied, so it's slightly more muffled, but with even less hiss. The last major hardware feature that deserves a mention, then, is the sleep mode. Press the green button on the side of the unit during play, and the pocket goes to sleep, keeping your progress in the process. Why is this such a big deal? Simple. The fact that it works with these original cartridges. The Pocket uses a live cartridge bus that behaves exactly like the real deal, so the fact that it works this well is actually really cool and unusual. But there is a caveat. It only works with single game carts. The EverDrive, for instance, does not allow for sleep mode, instead asking you to power down the unit. Knowing roughly how the EverDrive actually works, however, I'm not sure that there's really any good solution to this. Actual save states are also possible, but this feature is currently in beta, and these states are temporary, disappearing when you change games. According to Analog, more complete support is coming when Analog OS receives a major update that's coming soon. Still, between this and the sleep mode, there is a lot of additional convenience here when playing portable games. So yeah, my opinion on the hardware itself should be pretty clear by now. It's a beautiful device that does justice to the games it plays, but there's also an option to utilize the pocket on an external display, which is where the dock comes into play. The analog dock offers a nice weighted base with two USB-A ports, a USB-C port for power, and an HDMI port. You simply place the pocket in the dock and you're able to play on your TV and charge the unit. Discussing the dock is tricky, however. Analog tells us that an upcoming firmware update will add additional features to the dock, including the option to utilize the analog DAC, which is used for displaying digital devices on a CRT display, something I'm personally looking forward to. In its current state, however, it's pretty basic. So firstly, the display options themselves are limited. 
none of the advanced screen modes you get in portable mode are available when using the dock. Given the option for 480p, 720p, and 1080p output, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to be able to duplicate this perfectly as they're working with fewer pixels, but I would like to see this improve to at least match the colors and offer some sort of grid pattern. Instead, you only have access to a handful of palette options, and they're perfectly fine on their own with reasonably pleasing colors, but it's not quite what I'd hoped. It's actually more in line with something like the Super Game Boy or the Game Boy Player. And that extends to other elements as well, such as the color saturation. This is not available in docked mode, which means specifically for systems with color displays like Game Boy Advance, the TV output produces overly saturated colors that feel less authentic. Then, of course, there's the scaling options. If you're using any of the pixel modes in handheld play, which is likely, scaling is not available when using the dock. So to actually unlock these features, you first need to switch it over to the default display mode, the analog mode, before placing it in the dock. A little inconvenient. From there then, you can manually scale the image to your liking. Of course, you can also pair Bluetooth controllers with the dock, such as those from 8-Bit Do or Nintendo Switch Pro or the PS4 controller, as well as others that are coming soon. This actually integrates very well into the system. As soon as you drop it into the dock, press the start button on the 8-Bit Do pad, and it just automatically connects, making for a pretty seamless experience. It is a little bit fiddly to get it connected the first time, however. Also worth noting that currently, all games run at their original refresh rate when connected to the dock. Problem is that does not match the typical TV standard, and as a result, you'll see occasional duplicate frames, similar to the Game Boy Player from Nintendo. Prior analog systems had options like the Zero Lag Mode, which slightly adjusts game speed to match the refresh rate, eliminating these issues in the process, and I'm told that the dock is getting these same features as well. But really, that's about it for the moment when it comes to the dock. It's obviously very useful, but unlike the unit itself, it still needs those additional updates to shine. When they do arrive, I'll be sure to update my thoughts on this aspect of the system because I do have plans to utilize it. So with the hardware basics covered, that brings us to our next section, game testing, as well as discussion regarding additional features, such as the music composition through Nanoloop and GB Studio support. The Analog Pocket is effectively the first fully integrated FPGA-based handheld, but FPGA cores are not inherently perfect, right? So when looking at a device like this, it's all about testing those edge cases. You know, games that push the original hardware in unique ways that can trip up inaccurate emulators or FPGA cores. There's no way I could possibly test every game on the system for a review, but I can run through some of these games. And if it does run them correctly, it's a good sign. So I started with one of my favorite tests on the system, the now infamous Prehistoric Man. This game demands highly accurate timing as a result of its fancy background and pseudo-scaling effects. It, it leans on mid-scanline background and window palette data updates, and if your core cannot cope, the game basically breaks. Thankfully, the analog pocket sails through it perfectly. This game is not great to play, but it does look pretty good, I've gotta say. Check out those backgrounds. I then tried the Japan-only game X, developed by the talented crew behind the original Star Fox. This 3D experience works extremely well in the pocket without any visible issues that I could find. We're running through the demo mode here, but it showcases the cool fly-through sequences that are really similar to what you will find in Star Fox. I also tried two different racing games, V-Rally and Road Rash, both of which use clever tricks to simulate a 3D driving game, and both of these tend to exhibit or fail entirely on inaccurate emulators or potentially inaccurate FPGA cores, though by the time I tried it on something like the Mister, it worked perfectly there, and it also works perfectly on the analog pocket. The next one then is Star Trek 25th Anniversary. This one also works in the pocket, and it's interesting because it uses some window tricks to divide up the screen, which can cause issues for certain emulators. But again, as you can see, no visible problems here. 
Same goes for these Game Boy Color games. Episode 1 Racer has this issue where the ship is improperly masked during the intro sequence due to a priority problem with the background layer, but it works here on the analog pocket. Marble Madness was another one, which is known to cause issues for emulators. While Dragon's Lair, the very impressive conversion by the way, also works just fine. To further test things however, I decided I needed to turn to the demo scene, so I picked up a couple ROMs. I started with, is that a demo in your pocket? This demo pushes the original Game Boy hardware to its absolute limits and demands psycho accuracy. It's a really good test for building an emulator actually, as failing to accomplish this will break certain sequences entirely. The demo usually runs to a certain point, but you might end up with a blank screen or some other sort of crash issue. It's a very beautiful showcase of music and visuals that move so smoothly it's kind of difficult to believe that it was even possible on the hardware. And thankfully, this demo performs beautifully on the analog pocket, just as it does on real hardware. When it comes to Game Boy and Game Boy Color then, the only issue I managed to uncover is this. The homebrew DX conversions of Super Mario Land 2 and Metroid 2 Return of Samus. Metroid exhibits issues with the background tiles being the incorrect color, while Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2 DX do not start, simply displaying a white screen. The thing is, there are some visible glitches that occur even on a real Game Boy Color like this when moving between different zones, so, so I suspect there's something unusual about the way the hack functions. Kirby's Dream Land, though, actually does seem to work okay. Now, if you're swapping in different game carts, though, you might occasionally run into this. Yes, it's an error, but what does this mean? Well, if you're familiar with the original Game Boy, basically during the startup sequence, if the cart was dirty or not read correctly by the pins, the Nintendo logo would appear with varying levels of visual corruption. Remember that? Well, this is basically the analog pockets version of how it handles a dirty cart. It simply reports error. So take out the cart, clean it, and try again. Really though, I found it very difficult to locate any visual bugs or issues here. The chance of them existing is certainly not zero, but it seems like nearly every game should function pretty accurately to almost perfectly on the pocket. Now, for Game Gear and Game Boy Advance, however, I do not own a flash cart, unfortunately, so I can only rely on games which I own, which means my testing for these platforms was unfortunately more limited. Game Gear-wise, I tested games like Jurassic Park, which, by the way, is kind of a hidden gem, if you will. This game pushes the system in some interesting ways, with cool visual effects such as convincing parallax scrolling. It's not the only game to do this, but I really like Jurassic Park on the Master System and Game Gear. The Sonic games, of course, were something else I had to try, and they all run perfectly, well, as perfectly as they can, since these games have pretty serious slowdown even on real hardware. Every other game I tested, though, same thing. They all worked great. Game Boy Advance, though, is perhaps more interesting and challenging as this system relies on a 32-bit ARM processor. It's a lot more capable than the other supported systems. GBA emulation has already been perfected in Mr., but the lack of a flash card here means that I couldn't try some of the more specific big issues that you can see in certain emulators. That said, based on all the games I've tried, however, everything seemed to be pretty accurate even games which use the GBA in more interesting ways. I was very pleased with how the Pocket handled every single Game Boy Advance game I did throw at it, and like I said, I was just limited to real cartridges that I owned, and most of these don't really utilize the GBA in any specifically unique way. Honestly, when looking at the supported machines, it feels like the Pocket is in a very good place in terms of overall accuracy. Once I get a flash cart, perhaps I'll test some of the more demanding ROMs. Now, if you remember, I reviewed the prior analog releases, and I did manage to find some bugs in each of them. But that's not the case with the Pocket, which is kind of cool and unexpected. But there is something else I want to talk about, and that's the audio reproduction. So, I was speaking with friend of the show and super smart programmer, modern vintage gamer about this. He worked on building the emulator for the Shantae re-release, and noted that the noise channel reproduction in this specific game seemed to be a little off. I wanted to do my own test with the game, but others as well. 
What I found is that there is a difference indeed. The Pocket seems to produce a deeper sound with richer bass, while Game Boy Color has a more tinny profile. The noise channel though is a little harsher on the Pocket, which does lead to a different overall texture to the audio. See what I mean? There's definitely a difference, but honestly, I think what you prefer is going to come down to preference. So how about a track from the legendary Alberto Gonzalez from Turok 2 on the Game Boy Color, which is kind of an interesting game, I gotta say. Again, I feel the difference here is rather similar. It has deeper bass with richer sound on the pocket. But all right, how does it compare against the original Brick Game Boy? Well, this one's interesting. It's a lot closer to the pocket in terms of sound, isn't it? It still has a somewhat deep, rich sound profile. The Game Boy Color in comparison feels really tinny and quiet in comparison. It's not great. Honestly, when it comes to video and audio accuracy then, I do feel like the pocket scores very, very well. Every game I threw at the system, including those with holy grail bugs like in Pinball Fantasies, manages to run perfectly. Combine that with the input response, which is a match for the original hardware, by the way, and I think it's fair to say that this is probably the best way you could possibly play original Game Boy cartridges. I would say the Mr. Cores for these platforms seem to be equally accurate, but the Pocket's portable nature and super high-end screen helps make it possible for those of us that prefer original carts to enjoy playing Game Boy games once again. But there's one other aspect I'd like to discuss briefly for this video, and that's Nanoloop and GB Studio. So one of the cool features I didn't expect was the inclusion of bespoke software, basically. So Nanoloop is actually built into the pocket. You can load it up and make music like this. Firing it up, it's clear that there's a sharp learning curve in terms of understanding what everything does, but it'll feel at home for those used to utilizing Nanoloop, I'd imagine. I tried putting some tracks together, but yeah, I'm no musician. There are some additional accessories available for the Pocket as well, including link cables, sync cables, and the like. Everything you need to make music with Game Boy style hardware. It is, however, something I'd like to spend more time learning since the potential is very high for creating cool stuff. GB Studio, though, is a little different. There's actually an application on the PC side that you use to develop games. Basically, GB Studio 3.0 includes the option to export a format designed for the analog pocket. So what does this mean in practice? Well, basically, GB Studio is a tool used for creating Game Boy games, utilizing an entirely graphical interface. It's remarkably simple to work with. And from here, you can export your game in a format that can be read directly from the SD card reader on the analog pocket. So it's basically possible to create your own games on your PC and then bring them right over to the pocket for testing. As a quick test, I loaded up the sample world and made some changes to it. Using any simple graphical editing program, you can edit tiles and sprites, which can then be used directly within GB Studio. The sprite editor in particular is super streamlined, allowing you to import sprite sheets and directly work them into your game. For this demo, I used the Bubsy 2 sprite from the Game Boy port of that game 
just for Audi, and, well, it worked pretty well. The example worlds give you a feel of how different games might function, and there's a ton of customization possible, including scripting, music creation, building your own world collision, and a lot more. Everything you need to make a functional game. I had never used GB Studio before. I did dabble a little in some assembly language programming on the Game Boy, but I was kind of stunned by what's possible with this tool. Folks have made some really cool games with it, so it's not just a toy, really. It's possible to actually build something worthwhile, and it's nice that the Pocket natively supports GB Studio files. Either way, the addition of both of these features is a really nice bonus for the Analog Pocket that goes beyond just playing games. Oh, but before we wrap up here, I did want to briefly share my experience with battery life. The Pocket features a 4300mAh lithium-ion battery, which I think seems to be pretty accurate. The thing is, we don't really have any baseline expectations for a device like this, you know, a portable FPGA device, but I was pretty happy with the battery life. In fact, one charge was all I needed to do an entire day's worth of B-roll filming, and it still had plenty of battery. You're not going to get the battery life of, say, an original non-backlit Game Boy, but it's light years beyond the Game Gear. And since the battery's internal and can be recharged, you don't have to worry about swapping those batteries either. The last thing I want to mention is this hard case accessory, which is also available. As someone that collects a lot of retro handhelds, dust is always kind of an issue I find, and this case is a pretty good solution to both dust, but also keeping the pocket safe. There's also a tempered glass screen protector available if you desire. So yeah, that's the analog pocket. I've reviewed and played so many different modern products targeting retro games, software emulation devices, FPGA powered hardware, and of course mods for original consoles. I've bought so many of these things looking for the perfect experience. The Analog Pocket is the real deal and stands as my new preferred solution for playing the entirety of the Game Boy and Game Gear library. Honestly, I don't think there's anything better right now if you want to play those original carts. But what about the future? Well, that's the thing. In its current state, the OS is still lacking features, but those are slated for next year. These features are really interesting too, like the one that will make the second FPGA on the board available to developers for bringing their own cores to the pocket. Plus, the rest of the adapters are on the way, and improved dock support should arrive fairly soon. It's worth keeping all of this in mind right now when looking into buying one of these. Even without these features implemented yet, the Pocket by itself is a phenomenal achievement and is exactly what I've been searching for for years, especially when it comes to screen quality, which is where mods and systems like the GB Boy always fall short. In fact, on the Game Boy Advance side, I've never found a screen even remotely close to this. I've spent a lot of time and money sort of putting together things like this. It's an aluminum GBA. The case is absolutely beautiful. It has a new case, new buttons, a glass lens, a new IPS screen. The only thing that's really original is the main board. Heck, it even has a rechargeable battery and USB-C port. But I was never happy with the LCD. I don't like the way it looks compared to real hardware. Which is exactly where the Analog Pocket succeeds. But that's going to do it for this video. As you can tell, I was pretty happy with what we got in the Analog Pocket, but there's still more to say as new features come online. For the time being though, hopefully you enjoyed this video and we'll see you next time.